Welcome to a meeting of your planning commission, the official local planning agency for the cities of Tampa, Temple Terrace, Plant City, and unincorporated Hillsborough County. The planning commission provides innovative leadership and long range vision that contributes to the creation of a thriving, prosperous community that offers opportunity, fairness, and choice in how we live, move, learn, work and play. For more information about the Planning Commission, please call 813-272-5940. Follow us on social media or visit our website at planhillsboro.org. Welcome to the October 10th 2022 regular meeting of the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission. We thank you for attending this meeting. Your comments and participation are encouraged. To minimize feedback in the audio, all online participants in the meeting will be muted until it is their opportunity to speak. Planning commissioners should unmute themselves to indicate that they would like to speak. Please be sure to state your name at the beginning of your remarks for the benefit of the clerk. There will be an opportunity for members of the public to provide comments. When your name is called, you will be unmuted when it is your turn to speak. Please wait until the chair calls on you to begin speaking. State your name at the beginning, at the beginning of your comments and adhere to the time limits. If anyone has difficulties or is watching via HTV and would like to provide comments to be included in the record for local government hearing, please email them to planner at plancom.org. That's planner at plancom.org. For action items, the meeting will be conducted as follows. The agenda item will be introduced. Staff will give their presentation with a 15 minute time limit. The applicant will be given the opportunity to make a presentation with a 15 minute time limit. Following presentations, members of the public may address the Planning Commission when recognized by the chair. Public comment will be heard for three minutes per person. The applicant will be afforded a three minute period for rebuttal response. Planning commissioners will ask questions. Public comment will be closed. Then upon a motion, a second and discussion, a vote will be taken. With that introduction, I'll ask Commissioner Buzzard to lead us in the prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. And all please rise. All right, thank you. With that, I'll ask the clerk to go ahead and do roll call, please. Good afternoon, commissioners. Bernstein. Commissioner Bernstein. Buzza. Here. Cardenas. Here. Fernandez. Here. Handy. Commissioner Handy. Cress. Commissioner Cress. Lauk. Here. Powell. Here. Maria? Here. Orton? Here. Rodriguez? Here. Joseph? Here. Thank you. You have a quorum. Thank you. All right. Our second item on the agenda is public input for items not scheduled for action on the agenda. And we don't have anyone sign up for any public comment on that. So we will move on to item number three. Presentation of the Award of Excellence from the APA Florida for the FLIP Junior Program. And the presenter is Melissa Zornita. Or Lynn. Lynn Miranda. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Lynn. 
She can chime in too, of course. Um, but we were honored at the recent APA Florida Conference to receive an award of excellence in the grassroots initiative category for our FLIP Junior Program in partnership with the Tampa Heights Junior Civic Association and supported by many partners in the community and supported by many of you and other board members involved with Plan Hillsboro. And we'd like to show you a brief film that was shown at the convention in Orlando. Volume. I'm sorry, just please stand by. Planning today affects our future tomorrow. In 2021, Plan Hillsboro updated its non-discrimination and equity plan. We wanted to be more inclusive with our public engagement. And as a result, we created the FLIP Junior Ambassadors Program. So we partnered with the Tampa Heights Junior Civic Association, who serves a community of concern, and we taught the kids planning workshops, and they learned about ways that they can plan their neighborhood. On our field trip downtown, we learned about this map, City Hall. We went to City Hall, and then that's when they was just talking about what do we want to put in our neighborhood. I learned about that the the things, the black stuff, the flat things that's bumpy on the um the sidewalks are for blind people to trace them, so then they will know where they're at. Out of this program, what do you think you're gonna start doing? Today? Um, being more careful with the environment, like not throwing trash around. Not like messing up, not messing up my stuff, um, and trying to improve my um, neighborhood more. Flip Junior inspired me to want to be a planner and to want to be a mathematician. During the Flip Junior program, the kids created pop up cities and they produced TikToks about bicycle and pedestrian safety. They also rode different modes of public transportation and they even participated in beautification projects such as painting crosswalks and painting garden boxes in their playground. The FLIP Junior program inspired these kids and now they understand the power of their own voice and the value of creating opportunities, safe spaces, and beautiful places. I'm sorry, here's the award. <laughs> Davida Franklin and our, from Plan Hillsboro staff um, is here holding the award. And this is Naya Young from the Tampa Heights Junior Civic Association. And I'm going to let them say a few words. And then if you have any comments, and then we're going to get a picture of everybody together with this beautiful award. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Naya Young. I am executive director for Tampa Heights Junior Civic Association. I uh, just want to say thank you all so much, uh, one, for supporting um, this program. That video is just a you know, small snippet kind of what we've done um, over the summer. And just um, for us, a big thing is opportunity and exposure. Um, and so we love to just expose our kids to any um, and everything, um, things that they've never seen before. Um, so we're just really excited, and I can't wait for this summer. And just thank you all so much. Real quick, I just want to also thank you for supporting and for those of you who were able to make it out this past summer. And we look forward to seeing all of you next summer because I know you want to tour the port and uh, <laughs> see these wonderful young faces that are actually carrying the legacy that you are putting forth right now. So thank you. Did any of the commissioners have any comments? Well, I'll go first, I guess. I wanted to personally thank you, Lynn. I don't think we've gotten a chance to talk much since the boat cruise this summer, but I did have a really good time on that trip, and I really especially enjoyed, of course, like I always mm -hmm. say, the younger kids, the Flip Junior program being on there. I think it's really important, the exposure and the experiences 
that uh, were spoken about, especially for the younger ones, just to get them out there and get them mixing in the community and doing these sorts of things, you know, I think is really important. So I think it's really apropos the award and I salute you and staff and of course, Tampa Heights Association and all the work they do um, and all the partners who are involved. I mean, there were a lot of different partners who were involved in getting a lot of different things done. So I'd like to thank everybody involved and hats off to all of you. there any more yes Mr. Rodriguez thank you uh, I've participated in the uh, in the flip program for quite a few years now so I'm so happy to see that it's expanded into a flip junior program and we're getting even younger folks at a at an age where uh, you know we can really make a good impression and and, and help the community and the and, and our, our young citizens to move forward I really enjoy uh, my, my work with the Planning Commission and with the FLIP program in particular. So congratulations, it's a well-deserved award. Thank you, Thank you Commissioner Rodriguez. I was gonna say, and maybe we'll even inspire a few new planners along the way, we're hoping. <laughs> if everybody wouldn't mind um, standing in, up behind Nigel and Melissa and Cody, and I'm gonna snap a picture of everyone together. <laughs> He's trying to set us up, is what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Then you should get in the picture. Actually, you know what? We're going to keep it as good. Maybe. All right, on to our next agenda item. Uh, now it's down to business, all right. Uh, <laughs> item number four, action items, and we will start off with 4A, Unincorporated County Land Development Code Amendments. And the first one is LDC 22-1113, Land Use Officer, Land Use Hearing Officer. Presenter is Tom Hisney. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the commission. This is Jillian Massey with your planning uh, commission staff. Um, and just as a preface to these three items, um, uh, planning commission staff will present our finding on um, each LDC amendment, and then uh, Israel Monsanto from the county is online on behalf of Tom Hisney, and we'll present for him. So the first one, I'm sorry, let me put this in presentation mode. Okay, so number 22-1113 uh, um, is a land development code text amendment for the unincorporated Hillsborough County uh, relating to rezoning and land use meeting procedures. Um, background of this text amendment is that it's publicly initiated. Uh, we've done a review of this text, proposed text amendment um, initiated by the county and found it to be consistent um, with our comprehensive plan and recommend that um, the Planning Commission find it consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the unincorporated Hillsborough County Comprehensive Plan. And with that, um, Israel Monsanto is on, online and will speak in further detail on this item. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, Israel Monsanto Development Services. This is uh, LDC 22-11-13. The purpose of this text amendment is to modify the rezoning and land use meeting procedures. And it includes uh, providing for a more expansive record of board consideration and for revised duties and responsibility of the land hearing, land use hearing officers. Uh, it will maintain the zoning hearing master process with established criteria for consent agenda items and provide for the board would hear applications not meeting the criteria for consent agenda. It will also provide for an open period between the zoning hearing master hearings and the Board of County Commissioners consideration by which the record may be supplemented through the submission of additional reading or documentary materials. 
with a deadline uh, before the, the, the board hearing. Other changes would include the role of and qualification of the land, land use hearing officers and also the timing of open record period will be amended and no significant changes uh, have been made since that you lost, last saw this in your workshop and I'm available with questions. All right, thank you. We had one individual sign up in the public comment for this one. I don't see him online. Is Coleman Weaver present? No. I don't see anyone I don't know in the room. Is Coleman Weaver online? Did we have Coleman Weaver call in? We aren't seeing him online. Okay. All right. Then we will move right on. Close public comment because there was no comment. And I'll turn it over to the commissioners for comments, <laughs> questions on this item. Seeing none at this time, I'll go on ahead and close public comment on this item and open it up to motions from the commissioners. Commissioner Bozo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I find that we uh, find, uh, uh, what's this number here? 22113, consistent with the future of the Hillsborough County Comprehensive Plan for the son of the Hillsborough County County Board of Commissioners. All right, we have a motion of consistency finding from Commissioner Buzza. Is there a second? Commissioner Saria. I'll second the motion. All right, we have a motion of consistency finding by Commissioner Buzza, a second to that motion by Commissioner Saria. Any more discussion of this item from the commissioners? Not seeing any at this time. I'll ask the clerk to do a roll call vote on this item. Buzza? Yes. Cardenas? Yes. Fernandez? Yes. Lauk? Yes. Powell? Yes. Saria? Yes. Joseph? Yes. Thank you. Motion carried seven to zero. Thank you. All right. Next item up for a two twenty two LDC twenty two dash fourteen oh six go for tortoise habitat. Good afternoon, commissioners. Sean College with your Planning Commission staff. This is Land Development Code Text Amendment 22-1406 regarding gopher tortoise habitat. This is a publicly initiated land development code change requested by the BOCC on June 6, further clarified in July 26, and it accompanies comprehensive plan amendments um, that also are intended to strengthen the protection of gopher tortoises and their habitat. Those comprehensive plan amendments were briefed on last month and they are on your public hearing agenda this evening. The proposed land development code text amendment that accompanies those plan amendments would propose some strengthening of the gopher tortoise habitats and Mr. Monsanto following my presentation will go into the details of that. The Planning Commission staff have reviewed these proposed text amendments to land development code and find that they do further the existing policies of the comprehensive plan in regard to protection of gopher tortoises and their habitat, specifically environment and sustainability section policies 3.7.6 and 3.8.1. And with those considerations, planning commission staff would recommend that you find the proposed land development code text amendment consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the unincorporated Hillsborough County comprehensive plan. And with that, I'll turn it over to county staff for their presentation. Thank you again, Israel Monsanto Development Services. Commissioners, this text amendment will require applicants for development of land that includes gopher turtles uh, habitat to provide a gopher turtles borough survey. And it has to be prepared by a Florida uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission um, authorized agent and to report any previous violations of gopher turtles regulations in the state of Florida. The amendment will also provide for consideration of a smaller lot sizes requirements for developments that would preserve on-site significant wildlife habitat beyond the minimum required uh, established by the Land Development Code. Uh, it will increase penalties for unpermitted land alterations to significant wildlife habitat. And as stated by Planning Commission staff, this amendment is related to CPA 2215 of the Comprehensive Plan and implements those policies. Changes will also include modifications to Part 401 Natural Resources, uh, changes to PD, uh, district performance and dimensional standards to accommodate them, uh, the smaller lot sizes, and also uh, Part of 1106 of the enforcement section of our Land Development Code. And that concludes my presentation. 
All right, thank you. We did not have anyone sign up in the public comment for this item, so I'll turn it over to the commissioners for questions or comments. Yes, Commissioner Buzzard. This is probably directed to staff. Um, what actually triggers this? Is there an overlay in GIS that would tell a landowner that they need to get a gopher survey through Fish and Wildlife? I, I'll start and then the, uh, our county staff can jump in. But it, it's, as I understand it, it relates to the Significant Wildlife Habitat Program, which is in the county's land development code as well as the comp plan. And that program maps and designates certain areas uh, based on a threshold of size and the type of habitat that it's significant wildlife habitat. So those areas are mapped and we know where they are. And when uh, development is proposed in those areas um, and it's seen on the map that it's possibly significant wildlife habitat based on the mapping, then they go out into the field and verify it. But I'll let Mr. Monsanto jump in as well. No, that's, that's correct. That, that response is correct. We do have uh, the mapping of those areas. And so development within those areas will be triggered at that point, and also that's triggered also through the site development review process. Thank you. All right. Were there any more questions from the commissioners? Oh, sorry, Commissioner Lau, please. Thank you. Florida Wildlife regulates gopher tortoises in excruciating detail. So I'm wondering how this complements that and why it's necessary, given that it's pretty strongly regulated at the state level already for land development. Could you walk us through that, please? I, again, I'll begin. I'll let Ms. Mr. Monsanto take over after me. But yeah, we did take great pains not to violate the state requirements with regard to the, their, uh, what they are entitled to or what the uh, jurisdiction of the state is regarding gopher tortoises. But this refers more than to the, uh, the significant wildlife habitat program, which as a consequence of that protection would also, could also protect gopher tortoise habitat as well. But I'll let Mr. Monsanto jump in as well. Yeah, I think, I think that also captures the, uh, my same response. Um, you know, I would add also that the violation and, and the, uh, the penalty portion uh, makes it more stronger. Um, it basically, you know, land alterations, which consists of removing vegetation from on site or changing the site topography, is required to be authorized through the issuance of a county natural resource permits in most instances. But when violation of these requirements occur, the available remedy, and I'm reading from the staff report, the available remedy is to either cure the violation by having the appropriate permit issued after the fact to return to the site to the pre alteration state. And if, if an appropriate cure is not pursued, the enforcement case is brought before a court enforcement board, a special magistrate, which can order violation to be cured and daily fines in the event that is not cured. And so this enforcement structure could result in an early start of unpermitted alterations to significant wildlife habitat that would otherwise be permittable in accordance with the code that could be cured with the issuance of a natural resource permit. So the code would, would allow a disincentive for such actions. So this will require that any unpermitted alteration of significant wildlife habitat will require the restoration of the impacted land, uh, monitoring of restoration work. So, so this will basically try to mitigate and fix that problems that we have currently of unpermitted work as well. I think that underscores the point that I was trying to make. This is regulated at the state level in a lot of cases of what the developer can do with the land. So. I guess my, the, my baseline question is, why is this needed at the local level? Well, the state, the state does regulate the taking of significant, of, um, excuse me, of gopher tortoises. They do not regulate significant wildlife habitat. That is specifically Hillsborough County program. It uh, specifically was developed for Hillsborough County and is adopted into the comprehensive plan. So it's a different program as a consequence of, of protecting significant wildlife habitat, some of which may have gopher tortoises on it, or may not. Um, so there, there are two different programs. There's some overlap, but they're different. Okay, thank you. All right, good questions. Are there any more questions or discussions from the commissioners on this item? I had a quick question building on Commissioner Lauk's question, it just kind of popped into my mind. You mentioned something about the lot size shifting, smaller lot sizes coming into consideration. Is that because we had kind of a 
gap here at the local level or something that we needed to cover? I mean, that might be kind of related to why we need it at a local level versus a state level. Did that have something to do with the state versus local thing, the lot size shift or? I would say no. I think that's more of a local issue in that it just for the comprehensive plan amendment that you're going to see tonight in public hearing refers to that. It is here in the code. It just elaborates that that's one consideration. It doesn't want to leave it out of discussion, in my, in my opinion. We want to make it stated in the comp plan in the code that when you're looking to protect city infant wildlife habitat, uh, one way of working with the developer is working with lot sizes so that we can get maximized the, the amount of habitat we can protect. I think it's, it, that's what we're working toward, and I'll defer to Mr. Monsanto. Yeah, that's 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 correct. The the by allowing a small size, a small lot sizes in order to protect the habitat, that will give incentive to the developers, and also it wouldn't require the application to go in front of the commissioners, but it could be done administratively to um, because it's a protection of the uh, wildlife habitat as well. So it's basically providing for that lot development standard modification. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions or discussions on this item? Not seeing any lights at this time. I'll go on ahead and close public comment and open the floor up to motions on this item. Commissioner Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a motion that we find LDC text amendment 22-146-1406 consistent and forward this recommendation to Board of County Commissioners for approval. All right, Commissioner Buzz. Second. All right, we have a motion of consistency finding by Commissioner Powell, second to that motion by, cons by Commissioner Buzza. Are there any more discussions, questions on this item from commissioners? Not seeing any, then I will ask the clerk to go ahead and do a roll call vote on this item. Buzza? Yes. Hernandez? Cardenas? I'm sorry, is Commissioner Cardenas there? He stepped out of the room for a moment. All right, thank you. Fernandez? Yes. Lauk? No. Powell? Yes. Saria? Yes. Joseph? Yes. Oh, we need to have you call Commissioner Bernstein because he entered the room. He's here now. Okay. Bernstein? Yes. Okay. Uh, motion carried six to one. Commissioner Lauk voted no. Thank you. All right. Next up, we have 483 LDC 22 1115 housing section. Good afternoon, my name is Alvaro Cabalta. With Planning Commission staff, I'm here to talk to you about 221115. This is the LDC amendment accompanying the housing update to the Hillsboro Comprehensive Plan. Uh, so this is a publicly initiated amendment. Uh, this is traveling with the updated housing section of the Comprehensive Plan, HCCPA 22-08, which was transmitted by the BOCC on August 11th, and it may be adopted on October 13th this week. So this request implements the updated housing section. Specifically, uh, it updates and expands the existing standards for the provision of the affordable housing density bonus located within the updated housing section. So Planning Commission staff reviewed this amendment and uh, recommends that you find it consistent with the current adopted uh, comprehensive plan. Um, like I said, it updates the standards and provisions of the affordable housing density bonus, and it furthers the intent of future land use element objective nine, policy 9.2, and housing element objective 1.2 and policy 1.2.6. Uh, so after a review, the Planning Commission staff recommends that the proposed Land Development Code text amendment be found consistent with the goals, objectives, and policies of the unincorporated Hillsborough County Comprehensive Plan. 
And with that, I will turn it over to Israel uh, from DSD for more details. Again, Israel Monsanto Development Services, um, LDC 22-11-15. The purpose of the amendment is to revise and to add development standards to implement the affordable housing density. Bonus policies proposed for the updated housing section by the comprehensive plan under HCCPA 22-08. Requirements of the bonus usage including affordability term, the density setbacks and income requirement is going to be amended. The usage of this regulation, if adopted, only applies to those properties within the urban service area. A section of the code, specifically 61107, provides the standards to implement the affordable housing density bonus. And this amendment will update the code to reflect changes to the comprehensive plan. There are also revisions to affordable housing and affordable housing development definitions in the code included in these test amendments. And staff is available if you have any questions. Thank you. We didn't have anyone sign up in the public comment for this one either, so I will turn it over to the commissioners for discussions or questions on this item. Commissioner Baza. Question for staff. Um, everything here looks to me to be pretty reasonable. The only question I have is why the uh, term required for the, uh, the bonus is been changed from 15 years to 30 years. That kind of reduces some investor appetite into these types of projects. Um, and I'd like to see some or hear some qualifications or reasons for that. Sure. So practically, um, the reason for that change was driven from our collaboration with the Affordable Housing Services Department of the county. So they were a major part of our working group with the policy, and it was one of the strong recommendations that they came into our um, update with. Um, I mean, just from face value, it uh, allows for more market stabilization. Um, I understand that it is kind of uh, not favorable to developers, but given the current uh, state of the market and the housing crisis that we find ourselves in, our partners at AHS felt very strongly that uh, we increased the, the term. However, um, you know, other parts of the bonus were edited uh, or updated, I should say, to hopefully be more amenable to attracting developer interest. Commissioner Powell. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, actually, to answer part of Commissioner Buzzo's question, uh, since I sit on the affordable housing board for the county, <clears throat> this has actually been a, a pretty big issue uh, throughout the county where there's been several developments that have uh, started out being affordable housing developments and then the period for their loans, you know, had ended, and so they're no longer under those uh, that binding contract, and they flip over to you know market rate, and then get sold off. And so, like the the supply of affordable housing units that's existed has just been dwindling down and down and down. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion on the AHAB side of things and trying to what can we do to you know try to help preserve because it's easier to to keep what you have than try to build new at this point. So that's one of the main reasons why. Thank you, Commissioner Powell. Are there any more questions or discussions from the commissioners on this item? We're not seeing any lights. Then I will go ahead and close the public comment on this item, open it up to motions from the commissioners on this item. Commissioner Fernandez. Uh, like, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to make a motion that Land Development Code Text Amendment 221115 be consistent with the future Hillsborough uh, comprehensive plan for unincorporated Hillsborough County and forward it to the Hillsborough County Board of County Commissioners for approval. Second. All right. We have a motion of consistency finding by Commissioner Fernandez, a second to that motion by Commissioner Powell. Any more comments or discussion from the commissioners? Seeing none at this time, I'll ask the clerk to go ahead and do a roll call vote on this item. Bernstein? Yes. Buzza? Yes. Hernandez? Yes. Fernandez? Yes. Lauk? Yes. Powell? Yes. Sharia? Yes. Joseph? Yes. All right. Thank you. Motion carried eight to zero. Thank you. All right. Next up on the agenda, we have 4B, and that is the update to the city's plan amendment procedures manual for Plant City, 
And the presenter will be, I hope, yes, Mark Hudson. <laughs> A lot of us are having problems with Mike. Um, just to bring you up to date, uh, Plant City continues to uh, move forward and update their public outreach effort. And particularly this effort is being headed up by their Plant City Planning Board. And they're primarily concentrating on how they uh, garner public input during uh, the process of voluntary annexations and also their rezonings, but they also have some um, recommendations concerning our procedures manual. Uh, if you recall, it was back a couple months ago where they are now requiring signs to be placed to advertise not only our hearings with the Planning Commission, but also those before the city, their planning board and city commission. And that is being implemented this cycle. Another item that came up concerning adjacent property owner notices. Uh, currently in Plan City, we notify everyone, every landowner within 250 feet of a plan amendment. Uh, again, of all the hearings that are to be heard, Plant City Planning Board, Planning Commission, City Commission, uh, and the distance requirement for that is 250 feet, which is currently consistent with what is required in Hillsborough County and the City of Tampa. Uh, based on the rural development patterns, uh, the Planning Board recommended that when areas voluntarily annex in, uh, that this distance be increased to 500 feet uh, to garner more public input, particularly when uh, areas are being impacted in, in the more rural areas of Eastern Hillsborough County. Interesting enough, this uh, distance requirement is also being considered by Hillsborough County. Uh, it's already come before you for your recommendation and we expect it to be acted on by the Board of County Commissioners tomorrow. So Plant City seems to be uh, addressing this by kind of doing a hybrid uh, when plan amendments affect internal to the city going from a Plant City plan amendment a Plant City future land use category to another future land, city future land use category. It would remain at 250 feet, but when areas annex in from the rural area of Eastern Hillsborough County to garner more input from those larger uh, parcels that you would expect in these rural areas, that would be increased to 500 feet. And that, of course, needs it requires a change in the procedures manual, uh, which they hope to um, have this implemented for their next cycle, which begins December 1st. So I'm here today to uh, answer any questions you have, uh, attach as a resolution in support of the Planning Board's recommendation under these circumstances to increase it to 200, excuse me, from 250 feet to 550 feet. And uh, with that, I stand for any questions. All right, thank you. We didn't have anyone sign up in the public comment for this item either, so I'll turn it over to the commissioners for comments or questions on this item. Seeing none at this time, then I will go on ahead and close public comment on the item and open it up to motions from the commissioners. Commissioner Bernstein. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At this time, I move that we <clears throat> adopt the resolution to recommend to the Plant City Commission that the uh, edits discussed today uh, be approved, um, specifically moving the distance from 250 to 500 feet, and that uh, we pass it along for uh, consideration. Thank you, Commissioner Bernstein. Commissioner Buzzer. Second. All right. We have a motion to adopt and approve, and a second to that motion. Well, uh, that motion was made by Commissioner Bernstein, and the second to that motion was made by Commissioner Buzzer. Is there any more discussion or questions? Commissioner Powell? Did you say 550 earlier or 500? Uh, 500. If I said 550, that was a mistake on my part. It's 500 even. All right. Any more comments or Questions? Not seeing any. I'll ask the clerk to go ahead and do a roll call vote on this item at this time. Bernstein? Yes. Buzza? Yes. Cardenas? Yes. Fernandez? Yes. Lauk? Yes. Powell? Yes. Saria? Yes. Joseph? Yes. Thank you. Motion carried eight to zero. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Hudson. All right. Next up on our agenda, we are moving into our presentations and briefings. And the first one up is 5A TACPA 22 08 Comprehensive Plan Text Amendment, One Water. And the presenter is Melissa Dickens. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Melissa Dickens, Planning Commission staff. Uh, I now have the presentation up. I think I'm just going to uh, go ahead and show it. Okay. Uh, again, this is TA CPA 22-08. Uh, this is a briefing this afternoon. We're very excited as this is the first portion of the overall Tampa Comprehensive Plan update that is coming before you. Uh, we are taking a similar approach in our examination of the water resources components of the language as we did with Hillsborough County. Um, and so we're calling it One Water Comprehensive Planning for Water Resources. So this update is anticipated to uh, replace in its entirety the stormwater section, potable water section, and wastewater section of the Tampa Comprehensive Plan. Uh, we do have a, a centralized website where folks can, uh, or, or you all commissioners, can see the latest draft language and see additional background information, and that's at planhillsboroughorg slash Tampa One Water. Uh, I also want to uh, thank our city partners. We worked very closely with city staff to develop this section, vet this section, and make sure that the language is implementable. Uh, we have representatives here today from city planning. We also worked with sustainability and resilience, the water, stormwater, and wastewater departments over at the city. Uh, right now, where we are in the process, we're concluding the initial public engagement phase. We've held two virtual public meetings, uh, one in the evening and one at lunchtime, to try to reach as many people as possible. Uh, we also gave a presentation overview to the River Board Technical Advisory Committee and have also been working to get the word out on email and social and traditional media. Uh, and this is a slide to show you where we are in the process for the overall comprehensive plan update. Uh, the vision was brought before you a few months ago that was unanimously uh, approved by Tampa City Council. So now we are starting work on each of the individual sections, starting with the one water section. Uh, next, what you'll be seeing uh, is the mobility section update will be coming, uh, or excuse me, will be initiated in winter of next year, and then the future land use assessment study, which you all will be uh, workshopping a little later this afternoon, will conclude in spring of next year. And I want to pause a little bit and talk about uh, the vision and how One Water works to further the vision for the Tampa Comprehensive Plan update. We got a lot of really wonderful comments uh, and consensus from the community on the vision, and we hope to use each of the individual sections of the Tampa Comprehensive Plan to further and implement uh, those vision themes that the community shared with us. So One Water specifically, we believe, directly implements four components of the Tampa Comprehensive Plan vision. Those four components are there on your screen, uh, protecting the natural environment, and water resources, efficient use of land and public resources and connected infrastructure, uh, resiliency uh, and, and mitigation for climate change and extreme weather events, and ensuring that all residents have access to a high quality of life and opportunity. Um, I'll point out that the, the first bullet on the screen was ranked highest by the community. That's one of the reasons we're starting with the One Water section. That's something that com the community felt was very important in their vision. And the, currently within the plan, uh, the last time the Tampa Comprehensive Plan was updated was back in 2016. Much of the water resources language is a bit older than that, so we're taking a, a deep dive and look, looking at that language. Uh, we have the stormwater management, wastewater, and potable water sections separate within the plan, and then also some water resources related language that is found throughout other sections of the plan, such as the environmental section, future land use section, and the intent of One Water is to update and combine those different components and integrate the water resources related language from all of the different sections. Uh, One Water means different things in, in different contexts. In this context, how, how we intended in the comprehensive plan is to have language that reflects the interrelated nature of water and provides a framework for holistic water resources planning across the city. 
some of the concepts generally that we want to share with you. Uh, first is that there, there are some really good bones in the water section today. We want to retain uh, the, the language that, that is important and integral to protecting water resources today. So we have a mix of existing language and new language. We also have some new concepts related to water resources, uh, resiliency in water resources, green infrastructure, blue infrastructure, low impact development, uh, some language on equity and inclusion as it relates to water resources, and coordinating water with other types of planning. Uh, we've also updated and strengthened the existing, several existing concepts within the plan, uh, everything from environmental protection, making sure those uh, policies are crisp and clear, uh, ensuring that the language is, is, is clear on coordinated and integrated water resources planning, stormwater and flood prevention, uh, water conservation and reuse, and infrastructure maintenance. And there are five goals for the new section within, uh, excuse me, this new section within the Tampa Comprehensive Plan. They're summarized here on your screen. Uh, the full, uh, all of the goals and all of the objectives, uh, as well as the policies are, draft policies are included in your packet. But we believe these five goals reflect the broad nature of water within the plan, uh, water in different concepts, excuse me, in different contexts, and uh, reflect uh, how we would like to see water resources within your comprehensive plan. Uh, again, we have a, a general information page where you can find additional resources. Uh, we have the latest and greatest drafts there with the latest date. Uh, we'll, we've provided links to other documents such as the crosswalks uh, so that people can see what is being changed and proposed to be modified. We have our, uh, our previous event recordings and, and other materials. So that, that planhillsboro.org slash Tampa One Water or the QR code on your screen will take you to that centralized project page. And where we are in the process, uh, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we just concluded the initial public comment phase. Uh, this will come back to you in next month at your public hearing. It's then scheduled to go to Tampa City Council in December and then final adoption early next year. Uh, this concludes my presentation. I am available if there are any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the presentation. Were there any questions from the commissioners on this item? Discussion? No? I did have one question for you. I was I know it's still early in the process, but the city of Tampa has some vastly different water focuses, I'll call them, than the county does. So I'm wondering how that is necessarily going to be addressed throughout the process and different from the county. Because I can see, obviously, I've, you know, I've been here since the whole thing was going on and we started the one water thing. And I can see how that's grown into directing where Tampa's the framework for how this Tampa water chapter is coming about, but I, I want to understand how the focus is going to be shifted because mm -hmm. again, like I said, Tampa is a very different place than the county. Just, I mean, CSO combined sewerage overflow, huge issue, huge issue in the city of Tampa. You know, we spoke about it at the county level, not very in depth. I'm thinking when Tampa comes through, there should be more or less focus on that. So how, how are those things going to get meted out as you go forward? Yeah, um, you, you make a really important point. Um, although it has a similar name, the context for water resources planning in Tampa is, is very different. There's different issues, uh, different infrastructure. You know, there, there's not things like the urban service area boundary uh, that, that we really focus on or the septic to sewer is not as big of a focus within the city. Uh, we have worked and continue to work with folks in those different departments um, who are able to provide us information about what the critical needs are, where the areas of focus are, so that we can make sure that the language that we're developing is able to be implemented. Uh, some things that, that I see as a larger focus within Tampa. Uh, there's a, a much larger focus on resiliency. Uh, much of Tampa is in the coastal high hazard area. Uh, there is a much larger focus on, uh, on maintenance and, and aging infrastructure. Um, there are also uh, very large focuses similar to the county on green infrastructure and LID. Um, also, you know, within the city, it's, it's very important to make sure that uh, 
the, the planning is coordinated. There are so many different planning efforts that are happening right now within the city. We really want to make sure that we're coordinating with everyone uh, who's working on those different initiatives. Okay, very good. All right. Um, were there any other questions, comments? Not seeing any at this time. Well, thank you for the information and look forward to it coming back again. Thank you. All right. The next item up is 5B TA CPA 22-12 Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment 5215 West Tyson Avenue. And the presenter is Jennifer Malone. Jennifer Malone with your Planning Commission. I'm briefing you all on Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment 2212, which um, is in, at 5215 West Tyson Avenue. This is located in the Central Ta South Tampa Planning District in the Gandhi Sun Bay South neighborhood. It's also within the Coastal High Hazard Area. It's in an area of the city identified as Rattlesnake Point. And so we have an aerial here. The area has actually uh, changed a lot since this aerial, aerial was taken to the north, um, the West Shore Marina District with all of the um, residential and mixed uses has really built out when this aerial, aerial was taken that was still under construction. But as you can see, we have Southwest Shore Boulevard, it's south of West Gandy Boulevard, and it's along West Tyson Avenue. Um, and this whole point is really known as Rattlesnake Point. This is the location of chemical formulators, which has been at this location for a long time. Um, Rattlesnake Point is transitioning from industrial to more of a residential mixed use development pattern. Um, but on this aerial, we still see a lot of the industrial remnants. There's also about two, I think, two restaurants at this point on Rattlesnake Point right now. So this is privately initiated. It's small scale. It's about uh, 6.54 acres. And the request before you is from heavy industrial to community mixed use 35. On the adopted future land use map, we can see that the site is heavy industrial. That's that dark, uh, almost black color on the map. And there's also some community mixed use 35 on Rattlesnake Point, and that's the pink color. Um, the purpler color to the east of the site is urban mixed use 60. That's where a lot of that West Shore Marina District has developed. And then to the north is public, semi-public, the land along West Gandy Boulevard. And this is reflecting um, the request to the community mixed use 35, which as we can see is present on Rattlesnake Point already. So this would allow residential development. Currently under this future land use category, residential development is prohibited. So the biggest, uh, one of the biggest impacts is that it would permit about 228 dwelling units. It would also increase the amount of non-residential square footage that would be allowed for about 400,000, 427,000 to approximately 569,000. The site may use that floor area ratio for residential development. So those numbers, the 228 dwelling units could be a little bit bigger, but they can only do that if it's a mixed use project. That was a text amendment in the South Tampa Planning District that came before this board about a year or so ago. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions you ask Commissioner Brazo? Um, this had come up when I was on the planning board several years ago, Rattlesnake Point, um, and the issue that still needs to be addressed is you do have heavy industrial, heavy chemical work on that island. There's one egress, e e ingress, um, and I, I think that this transition is going to be ill-advised, so hopefully they're prepared for the next meeting on this. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the commissioners on this item? I did have an anecdotal question. Is Tony Garcia going to be here when we go through this uh -huh. again? <laughs> Give us another history <laughs> on the point. <laughs> You're going to have to have some meetings with him before you come back to us with this one. Um, thank you yeah. for the information. Thank you. Next up, we have 5C, TACPA 22-13, Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment 2713, Bayshore Boulevard. And the presenter is Danny Collins. Uh, good afternoon. This is Danny Collins with your Planning Commission staff. This is TACPA 2213. It's for a map amendment located at 2713 Bayshore Boulevard. Um, the subject site is located in the South Tampa Planning District. Um, it's within the Bayshore Gardens neighborhood, and the site is within the Colsai Hazard area. Um, it is shown, where's my clicker? It is shown here on the locational map. <clears throat> this is an aerial map of the subject site and the surrounding properties. Um, you'll see the subject site is highlighting this yellow color outlined in black. Um, it's generally at the northwest corner of uh, Bayshore Boulevard and Barcelona Street. 
um, the surrounding development patterns predominantly residential. Um, there are um, attached single family uses directly to the south, southwest of the subject site and also to the um, west, uh, northwest of the subject site. Um, this is a 15 story apartment building uh, to the northwest of the site. Um, and then also we have some residential uses um, to the north and northeast of the site. Um, Fred Ball Park is here um, on the map. Um, just a quick background, this is a privately initiated amendment. It's small scale in size. Um, the site is approximately 2.12 acres. Um, the request is to change the land, future land use designation from the residential 35 uh, designation to the residential 83. Here is um, the adopted future land use map. Um, again, you can see or the subject site is recognized under the residential 35 designation. Um, parcels to the northeast and um, south, southwest of the site are also uh, designated residential 35. Um, to the west and north uh, west of the subject site are parcels uh, designated under that residential 83 and then the CMU 35 um, uh, to the west and southwest of the intersection of Isabella and Barcelona Street. This uh, green line here denotes the coastal hazard area. This is uh, the proposed future land use map. Um, this um, showing the subject site under the residential 83 designation. Um, the residential 83 allows development up to 83 dwelling units per acre. Um, this is a slide showing the potential uh, impacts of the proposed change um, currently under the residential 35 designation. Um, the subject site can, can be considered for 74 dwelling units or just over 55,400 square feet of non-residential development. Um, non-residential development under the R35 would need to meet locational criteria. Um, as under the proposed uh, residential 83 designation, the subject site can be considered for a maximum of 175 dwelling units or uh, just over 60,000 square feet of non-residential development. Um, again, the subject site would need to meet locational criteria under the R83 uh, land use designation. Overall, the request uh, would, uh, may result in an increase in that density of 101 dwelling units or uh, just over 4,600 square feet of neighborhood serving commercial uses if the site uh, meets locational criteria. Um, the request does not have the potential to um, introduce new types of uses on the subject site. Both categories allow for the multifamily, uh, single family attached development pattern. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the commissioners on this item? Not seeing any lights. Well, thank you for the information and continue on to 5D. TA CPA 22-14 Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment 1112 West Waters Avenue and the presenter is Sam Thomas. Good afternoon, Sam Thomas with your Planning Commission staff. Uh, this is TA CPA 22-14 1112 West Waters Avenue. Uh, here's the subject site on our general locator map. It's in the University Planning District in the Lowry Park Central neighborhood. Here's the subject site on an aerial map. You can see it highlighted in yellow and outlined in red. It's bound by West Waters Avenue and North Newport Avenue. Um, along West Waters Avenue, you mainly have commercial, um, commercial properties along there. And then north and south of West Waters Avenue, the neighborhood and area generally transitions to single family detached homes. Uh, some background on this, it's privately initiated, small scale and approximately 0 0.39 acres. And the request is to go from community mixed use 35 to community commercial 35. Here's a subject site um, outlined in the dashed black line on our um, adopted future land use map. You can see that all along Waters Avenue, the properties are recognized under the community mixed use 35 um, designation. And then north and south of um, Waters Avenue, you can see that the single family neighborhoods transitions into that residential 10 future land use designation. Um, and here is the subject site um, with the proposed future land use on it, um, the community commercial 35. You can see that it is red now um, and the, uh, it kind of sticks out. Um, compared to the purple and the orange on the map. Uh, the potential impacts of this change, overall, um, there is the only change that would happen with this is that it would introduce the um, consideration of commercial intensive zoning on the site. Other than that, um, both land uses or future land use designations have the same density and same intensity. It allows the same FAR and same units per dwelling um, unit, um, which is 35 and zero or 2.0. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this item from the commissioners? 
Not seeing any at this time. Well, thank you for the information and move on to our next item. 5E TACPA 22-16 Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment 610 Northwest North Bay Street. And the presenter is Emily Phelan. Good afternoon, Emily Phelan, Planning Commission staff. This is Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment 2216, located at 610 West North Bay Street. It's located in the Central Tanfa Planning District, the Seminole Heights Urban Village, and also the South Seminole Heights neighborhood. This is an aerial of the subject site. It's right here in red. To the south along Dr. Martin Luther King Boulevard is the commercial uses and to the northwest and east of the subject site are single family detached homes. Just background, it was privately initiated small scale and is approximately 0.71 acres. The request recently changed to go from residential 10 to residential 35 and that request was sent in after the briefing packets were put together. This is the adopted future land use map. The subject site is in black and it's represented by the residential 10 designation and that designation is to the north, south, and to the east and the west. And then along Martin Luther King Jr. you can see the community mixed use 35 designation. And due to the recent change, we will have updated maps next month for the hearing. The site, is allowed to have 14 dwelling units and just slightly over 15,000 square feet of non-residential uses. The potential impacts, again, will change for the, the hearing next month. Um, that's, that's the end of my presentation, if you have any questions. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions on this item from the commissioners? Not seeing any at this time. Well, thank you and move on to our next item of business. Uh, 5F TACPA 22-17 Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment 701 East Linebaugh Avenue and the presenter is Katrina Corcoran. Good afternoon, one moment. Good afternoon, uh, Katrina Corcoran, Planning Commission staff. I'm here today to present Tampa Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment 22-17. This is located at 701 East Linebaugh Avenue. The general location of this plan amendment is within the University Planning District. It's within the North Tampa Community Neighborhood, and it is west of a transit emphasis corridor, specifically North Nebraska Avenue. This slide shows an aerial with a subject site uh, outlined in black with the blue shading. It is directly south of East Linebaugh Avenue, and it is uh, east of I-275 and west of North Nebraska Avenue can see it's primarily surrounded by single family residential. However, to the west of the subject site is a mobile home park. Some background on this amendment is privately initiated, small scale, approximately 0.5 acres, and the request is to move from residential 10 to residential 20. This slide shows the adopted future land use map with the subject site and outlined in the dashed black line. Uh, it is residential 10, primarily surrounded to the north and south by residential 10. Uh, to the east and west of the subject site is Community Commercial 35. To the south and northwest of the subject site is residential 20. And to the southwest of the subject site is residential 35. This slide shows the proposed change moving to residential 20. The Change in the potential intensity and density existing would be about five dwelling units with a little over 7,600 square feet of non-residential. Uh, with that change to R20, it would have tw 10 dwelling units and a little over 10,800 square feet of non-residential. Uh, any non-residential uses must meet commercial locational criteria. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Were there any questions or comments on this one from the commissioners? Not seeing any at this time. Well, thank you for the information and move on to our next item. 5G TACPA 22-18, Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment 803 West Linebaugh Avenue, and the presenter is Alvaro Galbadon. Good afternoon, it's Alvaro Gabaldon. Uh, 
back to talk to you about TA CPA 22-18, located on 803 East Line Ball Avenue. Did I, did I, is there a typo? Did you say West or? I said West, yeah, there is a typo. Oh, okay. Yeah, it should be East, I'm fairly certain. Um, this is the general location of the plan amendment. It's in the University Planning District and the East Forest Hills neighborhood. Yeah, so it's West. Sorry, I have the typo. Um, anyway, um, so uh, the purple or pink outlined parcel is the uh, planned amendment we're speaking of today. It's bounded to the West by North Boulevard and East uh, by North Ola Avenue. So some background on this parcel is that this uh, plan amendment is privately initiated as a small scale amendment. It's approximately uh, half an acre and they're looking to go from R10 to R20. So this is the parcel on the adopted future land use map. You can see in the black outline that it is currently R10. Uh, there's a block of R20 to the west. Um, within that block is a senior living facility and a church and uh, directly to the east that large parcel is also a church and uh, uh, r10 is typically single family so the proposed future land use map shows the transition to r20 you can see that r20 group uh, sort of getting bigger on west linebaugh uh, i forgot to mention that uh, the parcel directly to the west of the uh, of 2218 came before you last year and did a similar transition so the impact of this plan amendment would be going from five existing dwelling units and a maximum of set a little over 7700 uh, square feet of non-residential to uh, 10 dwelling units and a little over 1100 square feet of non-residential so this uh, proposed plan amendment would uh, increase intensity and density on the subject site and uh, any proposed non-residential uses would be uh, required to meet commercial locational criteria. That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Were there any questions or comments on this item from commissioners? Not seeing any. We'll thank you for the information and move right on to our next item. 5H TACPA 22-19 Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment. 2302 and 2304 North Boulevard and the presenter is Sam Thomas. Good afternoon, Sam Thomas. Uh, this is TACPA 2219 at 2302 and 2304 North Boulevard. Uh, here's the subject site on our general locator map. It's in the Central Tampa Planning District and the Wedgwood Park neighborhood. Here you can see the um, site on, on the aerial map. It's highlighted in yellow and outlined in red. It's bound by North Boulevard and West Park Avenue. Um, to the west of um, North Boulevard is the Ridgewood Park neighborhood, uh, this area right here. And then you can see the Hillsborough River farther to the west. Um, the Ridgewood Park neighborhood is mainly single family detached homes. When you move over to the um, east side of North Boulevard, you move into Tampa Heights and the Tampa Heights Urban Village. That area is a mix of single family detached, attached and multifamily homes. So much more, um, dense urban um, type of environment on the other side of North Hyde, Park, North Hyde Park compared to the single family homes mainly found on the other side. Um, and then moving farther south down, you can see um, the Pearl apartment complex, which is part of the Tampa Heights um, development down south of there. Some background on this is privately initiated. Um, it's approximately 0 0.34 acres and the request is to go from residential 10 to residential 20. Here's a site on our adopted future land use map. Um, you can see that it is um, outlined in the black dash mark just north of the site along North Boulevard and Columbus Drive where these three parcels are um, is where you had a future land use amendment not too long ago. It brought this parcel into CMU 35 and then the two parcels south of it to R35. Um, and then you can see the R35 on the east side of North Boulevard all in the Tampa Heights urban, urban village. Um, a little bit more on the south side of um, the Ridgewood Park neighborhood, um, but then you can see the majority of the Ridgewood Park neighborhood is in the residential 10. There is one um, parcel under the residential 20, which was also um, brought in under a comp plan amendment, I believe back in 2020 or 2021. Um, and this, da this green line here is the um, coastal high hazard area, but the site is not within the coastal high hazard. And here is the site recognized under the pros future land use under the R20. 
Um, so the potential impacts of this request currently under the residential 10, um, the site can be recognized, for, um, can be considered for three units or around 5,000 square feet of non-residential uses. Um, under the proposed residential 20, the site can be considered for six units or around 7,000 square feet of non-residential uses. Um, and it would introduce the possibility of the residential, um, residential multifamily 12, 16 and 18 zoning districts and along with the residential office one zoning district. Um, any non-residential uses would be subject to commercial um, locational criteria, which um, the subject does meet. That concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments from the commissioners on this item? Not seeing any, we'll thank you for the information. Move on to our next one, 5I TACPA 22-20, Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment, 5507 East Washington Street, and the presenter is Diego Guerra. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Diego Guerra, Planning Commission staff. Uh, this is the Tampa Comprehensive Plan Amendment 22 Tech 20, located at 5507 East Washington Street. Uh, the plan amendment site is located in the Central Planning District, uh, specifically in the East Side neighborhood, East Side Commercial Neighborhood. Uh, and of note, the site is located within the Coastal High Hazard, um, coastal high hazard Area. Uh, the site is located along the seam uh, of the eastern portion of the city uh, as depicted on the locator map along uh, the city and county line. Uh, this is a, a zoomed in aerial view of the site uh, found within the red box. The north is the Salmon Expressway and Adamo Drive. Between the Salmon Expressway and Adamo Drive is um, industrial area. To the west of the site um, is just wooded, vacant um, area that appears to be uh, occupied by wetlands. Uh, to the north, there's a few residences. Directly to the east uh, is the location of um, Plant High Rowing Team Practice Facility. Uh, and then on the other side of that, that uh, eastern triangle portion is a site that was brought in in 2020 for a plan amendment, uh, changing it to uh, residential 35, which was approved. Um, the, pro the site is a privately initiated small scale map amendment, which is approximately 3.25 acres. Uh, and the request is tr to take it from a transitional use 24 to a residential use, uh, I'm sorry, residential 35. Uh, on the currently adopted future land use map, the site is located in the black hash mark. Um, as I stated earlier, it is uh, along the Palm River uh, and it is along the seam with unincorporated Hillsborough County, which is that southern portion, a blue dashed line along the map, and that unincorporated Hillsborough County residential line to the south of that. Um, I did mention that it is part, it is within the coastal hazard area, which is, um, which you, is also depicted on the map. And uh, you can see that residential 35 site that was brought in. Uh, from previous plan amendment on the uh, graphic itself. Uh, and then this is what it would appear uh, should the site be uh, approved for transition to residential 35. Uh, the maximum density and intensity potentials, um, it, the transition would allow for an increase in dwelling units from the existing 78 to the, the proposed 113. However, it would minimize or it would reduce in the non-residential square footage space from 212, uh, 212,000 to a, a little over uh, 84, 84,000. Uh, and then the transition would eliminate the light industrial use allowed by TU 34, uh, the intensive commercial and office uses, which again are allowed by TU 24. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Thank you. Any questions on this one from the commissioners? Discussions? Not seeing any. Well, thank you for the information and move right on to our next item. 5J TACPA 2222, Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment, 101 West Amelia Avenue, 2500 and 2510 North Tampa Street, 106, 108, 110, 114 West Columbus Drive. And the presenter is Emily Phelan. All right, good afternoon, Emily Phelan, Planning Commission staff. This is Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment 2222. And as <laughs> Chair Joseph just read all those addresses, I'm going to spare you of that. 
This is the general location map. It's located within the central Tampa planning district, the Tampa Heights urban village, and the Tampa Heights neighborhood. The site is outlined in red and along Columbus Avenue is a mix of commercial activity and to the south of the site is residential. Just the background is privately initiated, small scale. It's approximately 1.38 acres and the request is to go from community commercial 35 and community mixed use 35 to urban mixed use 60. The site is outlined in black and you can see that the western portion of the parcel in pink is the community mixed use 35 and the eastern portion in red is community commercial 35. Along Columbus Drive, uh, there's a mix of community mixed use 35 as well as community commercial 35. And when you go further south is the residential 35 and further north across from Columbus Drive is the residential 20. This is what the proposal would look like. The site is outlined in black and is represented by the urban mixed use 60 category. Currently, the site allows for 47 dwelling units and slightly over 120,000 square feet of residential and or non-residential uses. The proposal to go to UMU 60 would allow for 82 dwelling units and slightly over 195,000 square feet. The request would also um, expand the commercial intensive uses across the entire site. Currently, commercial intensive uses are only allowed in the CC35 portion of the site. And this concludes my presentation, if you have questions. Thank you. Are there any questions on this one or discussion from the commissioners? Not seeing any, we'll thank you for the info and move on to our next item. 5K TACPA 22-23, Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment, parcels generally located within a portion of the block east of North Florida Avenue, south of East Columbus Drive, and north of East Amelia Avenue. And the presenter is Jennifer Malone. Jennifer Malone with your Planning Commission. I will uh, spare you rereading that title, but I thought it would be easier than listing seven addresses. Um, but th that is the general location of the amendment. It's in the Central Tampa Planning District in the Tampa Heights Urban Village and the Tampa Heights neighborhood. It's also within the Tampa Heights Local and National Historic Districts. Um, so the amendment Emily just presented on is actually just to the west of this amendment across um, Tampa Street. This one's at Florida and Columbus, and we see Amelia Avenue there to the south. So it's essentially um, two blocks of parcels. It's excluding a uh, right-of-way down the middle of the site. Um, I'll show you a little bit more on the future land use map. It's a little bit more clear. To the east of the site is the Lee Historic uh, Tampa Heights Elementary School. There's also commercial uses along this floor, portion of North Florida Avenue as well, and some residential uses along North Morgan Street. It's privately initiated, small scale. It's approximately 1.97 acres, and the request is from community commercial 35 and residential 35 to urban mixed use 60 and community mixed use 35. So here's the adopted future land use map. Um, you can see the red is the community commercial 35, and then the um, Brown color is the residential 35 to the south. We have residential 10 to the north and residential 20 to the northwest. And then a little bit of community mixed use 35 present along East Columbus Avenue um, over here. Um, this is the proposed future land use map. So we see that the, the parcels that were community commercial 35 are going to urban mixed use 60 along Florida and Columbus. And then the parcels that were community or residential 35 are going to community mixed use 35 along Amelia Avenue. Um, so the urban mixed use 60 again is at East Columbus and um, North Florida, and then the community mixed use 35 is along East Amelia Avenue. So that would overall greatly increase the density from about 46 dwelling units to 228 dwelling units. It would also increase the amount of non-residential and or residential uses from about 114,000 square feet to about 186,000 square feet. So overall higher residential density and greater commercial intensity. It also has the opportunity to expand the commercial general and commercial intensive uses over the entire site. The FAR can also be um, applied to the residential project, but development has to be consistent in character with the surrounding residential built environment. So I'm available for any questions. 
Thank you. Any questions or comments on this item? Commissioners, not seeing any. Well, thank you for the information. Move on to our next item, 5L, much shorter title. TACPA 22-24, Comprehensive Plan Map Amendment, 6112 Southwest Shore Boulevard and 4733 West Bay Avenue. And the presenter is Danny Collins. Uh, Danny Collins again with your Planning Commission staff. This is TACPA 2224. Uh, it's for a map amendment for the properties located at 6112 South West Shore Boulevard and 4733 West Bay Avenue. Um, the subject site is located in the South Tampa Planning District. Um, it's within the Gandy Sun Bay South neighborhood, and the site's within the Colsai Hazard area. It is uh, shown here on our locational map. Uh, this is an aerial map of the subject site and the surrounding properties. Um, you'll see the subject site is located at the northeast corner of Southwest Shore Boulevard and West Bay Avenue. Um, it's outlined in this black collar. Um, or primarily west of uh, Southwest Shore Boulevard are, uh, are, are single-family detached residential uses. Uh, they are to the east and south of the subject site. Uh, there is a light commercial use uh, directly to the north of the subject site. Um, to the west uh, west of South West Shore Boulevard are uh, single-family at attached uses. Um, the West Shore Yacht Club is uh, to the north uh, west of the subject site. Uh, just a quick background, this is a privately initiated amendment. It's small scale in size. Um, subject site is approximately 0.48 acres. Um, the request is to change the future land use designation from the residential 10 to the community mixed use 35 designation. Here is the adopted future land use map. Um, the subject site, including parcels to the north, uh, east, and south of the site, are recognized under the residential 10 designation, uh, which allows 10 dwelling units per acre. Um, directly to the west of the subject site are parcels um, recognized under the community mixed use 35 future land use designation. And then um, southwest of the subject site are, uh, are parcels recognized under the residential 35 designation. Um, the subject site is within the Colsai Hazard area, um, and it is shown uh, by uh, these uh, green lines uh, shown on the on the future land use map. Um, this is the proposed future land use map, uh, which would recognize the site under the um, community mixed use 35 future land use designation. Um, currently under the residential 10 designation, the subject site can be considered for four dwelling units or just over 7,300 square feet of non-residential development. Um, that would be subject to locational criteria. As proposed under the CMU 35 designation, the subject site can be considered for 16 dwelling units or 41,816 square feet of residential and non-residential uses. Um, due to the site being within the South Tampa Planning District, FAR cannot be util uh, considered for single-use residential development. Um, the, re the request uh, has the potential to introduce multifamily um, as well as commercial general uses on the subject site. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Any questions, comments from the commissioners? Not seeing any. Well, thank you for the information. And move on to our next item, 5M, City of Tampa Land Development Code Amendments. There's about eight of them, so I'm going to let Ms. Malone read each of them and then stop for questions after each one. Sure. Um, if it's the pleasure of the chair and the planning commission, I'd actually just like to turn over the presentation to Eric Cotton with the city of Tampa. He is online and Stephen Benson is here as well um, to give a briefing of all of these code amendments. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Um, Eric, if you're there, we're ready for you. Yes, I should be on screen, I hope. Um, yes, I'm going to share, you are. share my screen. This is the same presentation that um, city council will see as part of their um, the workshop. I hope you all can see it. Can you all see the screen, the spread, the PowerPoint? No, we still see you. There okay, we go. Now, can we it? can see it now. Okay, good. So this again, this is um, these these concepts first went before City Council in June of 2022, and I'm just going to go through the the PowerPoint is set up in the same order as your agenda items. This goes to Council as a workshop later this month on the 28th. So. Um, Again, this is set up in the same order that you all have it on your agenda. And so the first one is an alternative design exceptions right now. Um, design exception ones, which are administrative processes, are not noticed even for setback requests. So what this request is doing, what this amendment would do, would be requiring all alternative design ones, which are which would be in basically seminal heights and the different overlay districts when somebody's asking to reduce a setback, this would require them to do notice. 
per 27 149 was the notice section do you want me to pause for questions or just go run through the whole thing yeah hang on for a moment we'll see if any okay. of the commissioners have any questions or discussions on this one i'm not seeing any so we'll let you go ahead with the next one okay um the next one is to allow non-conforming structures to uh, to be approved for extended family residences right now in the special use criteria if a detached accessory structure is non-conforming and somebody wants to use it for an extended family residence it requires administratively we deny that request and it goes to city council on an appeal um council routinely overturns staff so instead of adding that lux level level of bureaucracy um this is an effort to basically streamline it and allow for structures that are non-conforming to be allowed to be used for an extended family residence and we're amending the special use criteria all right let me see if anyone has any questions on m2 not seeing any so we'll ask you to continue okay thank you um now this is sort of out of order this is m27 and 8. this is discussions regarding accessory dwelling units um right now in the code they're only allowed in one place which is seminal heights with your zone so if your zone shrs and seminal heights you can do a special use one for an extended family res for, excuse me for an accessory dwelling unit this this section codes are what we're doing here is creating allowing them in any of the zoning districts that are in the that would be located in the central tampa west shore or university planning districts we're not including new tampa or south tampa um creating specific standards for those uses creating parking standards and then they would be allowed by right if you can meet those criteria all right do any of the commissioners oh did you have any more or were you pausing no no i'm done with that section okay uh you did any one thing did any of the commissioners have any questions or comments on that one or that grouping two seven and eight no all right please continue okay um let's see um this is an effort to amend the code to allow right now in in the city of tampa per chapter 27 if you want to do a mix a multi-family or single family attached in a commercial or non-residential zoning district outside of the industrial districts you have to go through either a special use one or go through a rezoning from let's say from cg to rm24 to a plan development what this is proposing is to allow these uses by right this was in effect back in the old chapter 43 back from that was in effect from 56 through the late 80s this would have been allowed by right to do multifamily in a residential in a commercial zoning district this is bringing that concept back these also are one of those things that when you go to city council um council does tend to overturn staff on these and allow for those uses um the concept would be you wouldn't you would not have to go through a special use process it would just be allowed by right. All right, let me see if any of the commissioners have any questions on M3 comments. Nope. All right, please continue M4. Um, in our right now by policy, we process um, development in the in the downtown district. We do what's called a DDR, which is a district design review. It's an administrative process. However, it's not codified. We've been processing these for about five or six years. Um, and this is the major developments that you see, the high rises that go on in downtown. We never had it codified. This is actually codifying that those um, the process and the requirements. All right, Are there any questions on this one from the commissioners? Not seeing any, we'll ask you to continue on, M5. Thank you. Um, this is an amendment to section 27282.9 and 27282.10 if um, the commission can re can recall um, there was a privately initiated text amendment by steve michelini uh, i think two cycles ago that allowed for multi-family townhouse style developments they would not have to they the front entrances would not have to face a public street they could face interior courtyards by right this is amending both that section to clarify some of the language that was in the privately initiated text amendment, as well as allowing single family attached, which have the same massing and scale generally as a 
townhouse style development but multifamily to allow them to face interior courtyards versus having to face the public street. This is normally processed as a design exception. Generally speaking, again, when on an appeal, when we deny these requests or we approve these requests, if they get to be for city council, council tends to uphold um, staff decision on allowing those kinds of development standards. All right, were there any questions or comments on this one? M5, not seeing any, we'll ask you to continue, M6. Okay. Um, off-street parking standards, this is a typical request that comes as part of a plan development, which is to have access onto a local street. This is mimicking language that's currently in the code for Seminole Heights, which is if you're a non-residential development on a local street, that you want to have access onto a local street as long as that entrance or exit is within 150 feet of an arterial or collector roadway, we would, you would be allowed to do that by right without having to go through another process to get permission, generally, again, going through a plan development and asking for that waiver. All right. Are there any questions from the commissioners on this item discussion? Not seeing any. We will okay. ask you to move on, but I think that was the last one. No, that was the last one, yes. All, All right. I didn't have any questions. Okay. All right. Did you have any closing statements, Ms. Malone? Um, well, actually, I don't want to take Jennifer's spot, but no, it's okay. <laughs> this goes before City Council. We're doing a public information workshop next Wednesday night on the 18th. This goes to a workshop in front of City Council on the 27th, and we should be coming back to the Planning Commission on the 14th. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. Jennifer Mullen with the Planning Commission. That was all I, that I was going to add, is that you'll see these re with a recommendation next month. It's actually going to be November 7th. Okay. 7th, okay. All right. Are there any last questions going once? All right. Thank you for the information, and we will move on to our close to the last item of business uh, six executive director's report and the presenter is Melissa Zornita good afternoon Melissa Zornita executive director um, at your seats you should have several sheets of paper um, one of them is my report um, I'll highlight a couple of activities that have been going on since our last meeting. Um, we kicked off the Fowler Avenue vision plan with a staff kickoff with uh, internal agency staff, but also staff from DOT, Hart, City of Tampa, in Hillsborough County um, that uh, you all approved the consultant contract for that over the summer and it's anticipated to be about a, a year and a half two year process um, I wanted to follow up that uh, to something that was mentioned in my report last month about the county being uh, interested in age-friendly communities. We did have a follow-up meeting with them on September 22nd. Um, the staff of Aging Services, as we sort of anticipated, were a bit, bit overwhelmed by all of the requirements that the AARP has in place for becoming designated as an age-friendly community. Um, but they have a lot of things that they're doing that embody those same concepts. So we had a really good discussion with them about some ways that we could incorporate um, additional policy language in the comprehensive plan about age-friendly communities, uh, also working with the TPO, connect them with their Transportation Disadvantage Committee, as well as their Citizens Advisory Committee to make sure that those uh, issues particular to um, the aging community are being addressed um, in our planning processes. So um, it, it made for a good, a good start of a good relationship there with that staff. Um, as everyone experienced, the week of September 26th, we had uh, a, a change schedule because of Hurricane Ian, um, and uh, we were pleased with how we were plugged in with the county's emergency action group meetings. Um, they had those every day. Um, we were participated in that. They did not end up needing any of our staff for um, either pre or post disaster services, but we found that the process worked as, as, as well as we could kind of give it a test run out of how that would work. Um, 
We have had quite a number of public outreach meetings, um, whether it was on the One Water project you heard about today, um, the Tampa land use assessment, which you're going to be having as part of your workshop, some discussion on, um, or the some follow up on the locational criteria, um, which will be coming back to you all at a public hearing in December. So I did want to mention that uh, coming up in the next week or two, you will be getting some um, inquiries from Sharon about uh, scheduling one-on-one -on -one briefings on that commercial locational criteria. We wanna have time for each of you, if you choose, to meet not only with staff, but also with the consultant team to um, answer any questions, um, walk through the changes that we've made in response to the stakeholder meetings that we've had. Um, we have another one actually coming up next week on the 18th, I believe. So we've had, we've had some good engagement on that topic. Um, also at your seat is um, the statement of interest form. So your bylaws call for that at the October Planning Commission meeting, you all fill out your interest in running for an office. Um, there's chair, vice chair, and member at large. Um, there also is the opportunity to be um, the appointed member to the Transportation Planning Organization. Um, right now that is Commissioner Powell. Um, they meet on the second Wednesday at 9 a.m. Or no, so is it 10.30? 10, okay, <laughs> in the morning. <laughs> Sorry, the uh, the policy uh, subcommittee meets from 8.30 till 10, and 10. the regular okay. meeting starts. At 10, right. Um, so we need a member and an alternate for that, because if, if the member can't attend, we're allowed to send an alternate. We also have the opportunity for you all to sign up for some of our optional volunteer committees. We have the Public Information Committee, which organizes, uh, helps organize the awards program, gives guidance to Lynn and her team um, on development of that program that right now is headed by Commissioner Powell. Um, we have the Budget Committee, which uh, works with me uh, on the uh, formulation of the budget every year and provides guidance on that. Um, that right now is chaired by Commissioner Joseph. And um, then we have a representative to the Hillsborough River Interlocal Planning Board Technical Advisory Committee. Um, which is right now Commissioner Powell. So, um, so would love to have some other folks volunteer um, for some of these roles. Um, there's another one I think we need to have for the Affordable Housing Board as well. Oh, yes. Um, that, that term ends, ended. Okay. That was a, and it's a three-year appointment for that person. Right, but because your term is up, it will end earlier. Okay. Um, so I hope you don't mind me saying that Commissioner Powell has, has indicated that he's not going to be uh, submitting for reappointment. So we're definitely going to need folks to fill all these slots because we're not going to have um, him to fill them. Um, so yes, if you're interested in the Affordable Housing Advisory Board, that meets on the second Monday in the morning. Um, of the, uh, it's the same day as this meeting. Um, please feel free to write that in at the bottom. We'll, I'll collect all of these forms. Um, if you want to email it, we can, we can email it in if, um, as well. We can send you out one. Um, electronically, we'll be sending that to Commissioner Handy and Commissioner Kress um, as well. So next month at the November meeting, we'll have the election. Those who have expressed interest will be put on the ballot. There will be a blank spot for adding of names if anybody decides between now and then that they change their mind and they'd really like to be in one of these roles. Um, so please uh, hand that over to me when you get a chance um, and make sure you put your name on it. Um, also at your seat is the proposed 2023 calendar. 
all of the meetings fall on the second Monday. As, as you noticed by what uh, Jennifer said at that last agenda item, next month's meeting is on November 7th, which is not the second Monday. This is one of the few that got moved because HTV had a conflict. Um, going forward, we, we have um, all the second Mondays for next year. They don't interact with any holidays like Veterans Day or um, anything like that. So um, if, if there's no objection, we'll move forward with keeping all the meetings on the second Mondays. Okay, wonderful. That will help staff plan for next year's calendar. Um, the other item that I wanted to mention was on the, as part of the agenda packet, I provided you a copy of a letter I have drafted in support of the TPO making a grant application to the Reconnecting Communities Pilot um, Grant Program. They are uh, submitting a proposal to look at the implications of new visions for the 275 corridor north from downtown um, to, I think, Bears as the end location there. Um, and they have asked for some in-kind support. And what we have identified is that we could look at for the different scenarios they come up with, any possible changes to future land use that would be needed in the corridor, the changes that that then would generate to our population and job uh, projections within the corridor, and that there also is the opportunity to work with the Flip and Flip Junior programs who draw some uh, many of the students who participate in that um, from that corridor um, as an engagement opportunity. Um, that provides an in-kind value of approximately $27,000, um, the project would not start until 2023 and would be a multi-year project. So um, we don't anticipate, um, I don't even think they'll get the grant notification if they're awarded till 2023. So the project, if it starts in 2023, it'll be later in the year. So we don't anticipate um, a lot of immediate work program impact, but I wanted to inform you all that I was going to be um, sending that letter. think that that's all I had as a report this month. All right. Doesn't seem like anybody has much to say to you. So, okay. well, thank you for Great. the information. Thank you. <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> all right. Item number seven, uh, other business, chair's business. I don't have any uh, old business. Does anybody have any old business? There's no old business pending. No. All right. New business. Does anyone have any new business? Not seeing any at this time. We will move on to committee reports. Commissioner Powell. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, Affordable Housing Board uh, met this morning, and um, for I was not at the last meeting, unfortunately, couldn't attend. But for this meeting, there is a new uh, director now, as I understand. Um, and so I don't believe Cheryl is going to be, I think she's moved to a different role within the county. Um, so that will be headed up by, I forget the lady's name, she was on um, screen today, but uh, so that's being headed up. Um, the topic of discussion was there's a lot of new evictions apparently, and they think it's being produced from people getting ready for the hurricane here and then, you know, not hitting. So there's like 1,300 evictions that were filed on um, the last two weeks or something like that that are coming up. So it's the highest amount that we've, I think someone said that we've ever had uh, in a cycle um, or a 30-day cycle. So looking at ways to uh, thwart that, and there's been some uh, updates to the Tenant Bill of Rights, uh, which if no one's familiar with, uh, I can go over what I recall, but uh, I know staff has all that available as well. So, um, and then in terms for the TPO, that meets on uh, Wednesday, so I don't have anything. Right, thank you. Commissioner Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the City of Tampa Affordable Housing Advisory Committee met on September 21st. Uh, we had uh, briefings on various uh, housing and development uh, division programs, such as the Down Payment Assistance Program, 
the homeless outreach activities within the city, the uh, rental move-in assistance program, and then uh, the various construction projects and programs that are being managed by the division. So it was a pretty comprehensive um, briefing, and our next meeting will be on October 19th. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rodriguez. All right, I believe Ms. Ornita has one final announcement for us. Yes, I was remiss in reminding you all about the Planning and Design Awards, which is on October 27th uh, in the evening from 5 to 8 at the um, JCC in West Tampa. Um, it's a, our 40th anniversary. We're very excited about that. Um, we hope many of you all will be able to attend. The planning commissioners are the ones who traditionally hand out the awards. Brenda McLaughlin, who used to be of ABC Action News, will be our MC. But um, we have a commissioner on stage handing out the, the trophies. So hope you all will join us to help us with that. Um, and uh, it, the information is all on our website about how to get tickets and things of that nature. Thank you. All right. That is all we have for this meeting. So I think we have a workshop after this coming up. And then our public hearings will be back at 530. So meeting adjourned. <laughs> yeah. And if, if you all want to... Um food in there if there's food in there <laughs> um, and uh, the the workshop we were thinking we'd start about 345 give y'all a little bit of a break and opportunity to eat and then we're gonna be in the plan Hillsborough room for the workshop so we can be a little bit more comfortable and chat thanks all right now meetings adjourned <laughs> thank you <laughs>